All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. As Liz mentioned, my name is Eric Lee Motter. I am one of the directors of the pollinator conservation work at the Xerces Society. I'm going to cover a lot of ground here today. But before I do, I wanted to initially thank all of the Xerces Society supporters, foremost among them are members. We are a member supported nonprofit. I'll have more information at the end of the presentation today about becoming a Xerces member. So for those of you who may not be familiar with us, the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation is a now 50 year old wildlife conservation nonprofit organization named after the now extinct Xerces blue butterfly. And this was the first butterfly to go extinct in North America as a result of habitat loss. It was a native to California. And for the first few decades of our life as an organization, Xerces truly was a butterfly conservation group. But over the years, we've expanded our focus to include our, a huge range of work on invertebrate animals, everything from uh, still butterfly conservation, but also pollinator conservation in agricultural landscapes, pesticide policy and reform, endangered species advocacy, uh, work around the conservation of previously totally unlooked groups of animals like freshwater mussels, work on animals that we still don't have a, a deep understanding of their conservation status, like fireflies. We've got a huge range of work that we do as an organization. And people are oftentimes um, perplexed by the fact that there is a a group out there working specifically around insect and invertebrate conservation. I would just point out that these are fundamentally probably the most important animals on the planet in terms of ecosystem function. They are, of course, pollinators of plants, and we're going to spend much of the day today talking about pollinators, but they're also animals that play a critical role in things like the, the production of soil and the cycling of nutrients and the sequestration of carbon in the soil. Invertebrate animals are also the primary food source for everything from salmon to, uh, to grizzly bears. So they have these multiple roles in ecosystem function. And of course, these are also the most abundant and diverse living organisms on earth today. If we just look at animals, and hopefully your, your screens are all working, you can see this. If you look down at about the, the five o'clock position on this pie graph, you can see what a tiny sliver of animal life mammals make up on planet Earth. This is a, a planet that we inhabit that is largely a planet of insects and a, a planet of invertebrate animals. Much of my work at Xerces focuses on agricultural landscapes, on farm systems and increasingly very large scale farm systems. So part of my presentation this morning is going to be viewed through the lens of that work, the work that I do in agriculture. But towards the midway point, I'm going to shift gears and we're going to start to look at how we apply the lessons learned from that agricultural work, which is where our pollinator program started. And, and begin to talk about how we can apply those lessons learned to cities and suburbs and the human built environment. Uh, but I would just point out that this is what a lot of my day to day work looks like. This is a, a blueberry farm on the screen with the blueberries there on the right. This is a wildflower field border on that farm. And this is a farm that does not bring in um, honeybees to pollinate those crops. Um, this is a farm that provides this habitat to support wild pollinators, and those wild pollinators and the sustainable population of them are what pollinates that adjacent blueberry cropland. 
Um, when we talk about pollinators, there are, of course, these kind of clever and dramatic uh, statements and statistics we can, we can bring out to describe their value to us as humans. We can say, for example, that uh, approximately 85 or 90 percent of all plant species on Earth require pollinators or strongly benefit from pollinators to reproduce. We can make these bold statements like one in every three mouthfuls of food and drink that we consume are, are uh, the dependence on pollinator services. We can say that this is a service worth billions of dollars a year. But from my perspective, trying to put a dollar value on these is much like trying to put a dollar value on oxygen or clean water or any other what we typically call ecosystem function. We don't have a direct substitute for these services. So essentially, the, the role that pollinators have in our food system, in our ecosystem function is, is a priceless role. Now, um, pollinators, of course, include many different types of animals, butterflies, moths, flies, beetles, uh, certain types of possums in Australia, lemurs in Madagascar, hummingbirds, bats. But of all of these different groups of pollinators, bees are arguably the most important. There are several reasons why this is the case. Um, the first being that bees are the animal group, the primary animal group that is adapted and has evolved specifically to gather and transport large amounts of pollen. And they do this because pollen is the larval food source for bees. It's what they feed to their developing offspring. Pollen is very high in protein, anywhere typically from three to 30 or 40 percent protein by weight. And so that protein-rich food source is what they're feeding to their developing protein-hungry offspring. And then as adults, bees switch to this carbohydrate-based diet of flower nectar. So in the process of gathering that huge volume of pollen that they need to support their young, they're constantly dropping a lot of pollen along the way, dropping it on different flowers that they visit and facilitating cross-pollination. And this is why bees have these big, hairy, robust bodies. Those hairs are meant to, to hold pollen to them, to, to have the sticky pollen grains affixed to those hairs that they're, they're carrying about. Bees also have a behavior called floral constancy, meaning that they typically have a very strong affinity to a particular species of flower in a given time frame. So a bee visiting a blueberry bush will usually go from blueberry flower to blueberry flower to blueberry flower in close succession, facilitating, again, the cross-pollination within that species of plant. And this is different than other flower visiting insects that may visit three or four or multiple species of flowers in close succession, which doesn't necessarily facilitate the movement of of pollen grains within a single plant species. And finally, bees have, uh, of course, a nesting uh, habit. They, they construct a nest, they lay their eggs in that nest, they provision that nest with food for their young. And so we are able to capitalize upon that as humans by, on the one hand, putting something like a honeybee hive out in an apple orchard and reliably knowing that the service, the pollination service of that hive will radiate out some distance, the foraging distance that those honeybees have from their nest. Or we can do, again, what I, what I do, um, which I showed in the earlier slide, we can create habitat systems for pollinators and expect the service of pollination to radiate out some distance from that habitat. So to set the stage here on pollinator conservation in cities and towns and suburbs, I wanna first reflect on the status of pollinators and insects and wildlife in general on earth today. And of course, there have been no shortage of um, doom and gloom stories over the past decade and a half 
on pollinators and insects. And there's a certain amount of hyperbole to some of these, but unfortunately there's a, there's a core truth to the, the stories we hear of insect and pollinator decline. To begin with understanding that it's probably good to first sort of deal with and dispense with the, the status of honeybees. So honeybees are not native to North America. They are an introduced species. They are a managed uh, animal like chickens or cows. Um, of course, they've become feral over the centuries, and we've had many, many uh, centuries on this continent with feral introduced honeybees that have done really well for themselves. However, beginning in the mid part of the last century, the number of managed honeybees in the United States began to decline and began to decline fairly steadily. And there were a number of contributing factors to these declines including habitat loss, including the, the increased use of pesticides, uh, diseases, parasites. And you can see a parasite on this photo here on the back of this honeybee, that brown disc is a varroa mite. It's a, a parasite of a, of a different honeybee species, an Asian honeybee species. And this parasite was accidentally introduced to the United States several decades ago and has been potentially the most detrimental uh, development in American beekeeping. These, these varroa mites not only suck vital fluids out of their hosts, but they also vector viruses between bees at the same time. And it's made beekeeping in the United States extremely difficult, and it's really changed the economics of beekeeping in the United States. And on that economic point, we can see the fallout of that in some of our agricultural systems. The easiest one to, to show this trend with is the case of almonds in California. And almonds are a crop that very strongly benefits from, and in some cases really needs honeybees for pollination. There are currently over 900,000 acres of almonds in California. There are also on a good day, 1.5 to 2 million honeybee hives, commercial honeybee hives in the United States. The almond crop, which comes into bloom in uh, about a month from now will will essentially need to rent all of the honeybee hives, the commercially available honeybee hives in the United States to pollinate that crop. That 900 or million, 900,000 or million acres of almonds is typically stocked at a rate of one of at least two honeybee hives per acre. So there's a supply and demand challenge here. If we go back to the mid 90s, when there were not so many almonds, there were fewer almonds, there were more honeybees, that rental rate that the almond farmers pay was significantly less. It was averaging around 35 to $40 to rent one single honeybee hive for the pollination of this crop. By 2005, that number had just about doubled as the acreage of almonds had increased and the number of commercial honeybee hives began to decline even further. And then 2006 came along and suddenly the news broke of this phenomenon called colony collapse disorder where beekeepers were losing, uh, in some cases, half or more of their honeybee hives and you had beekeepers going out of business and suddenly this supply and demand became, supply and demand issue became a real crunch. And this is what happened to the average cost to rent a honeybee hive. By 2006, 2007, 2008, you had almond growers paying an average of $200 to rent a single honeybee hive. Now, the numbers have not continued to go up. The rental rates have not continued to go up significantly, but they're, they've not come down and they're not likely to come down. And this seems to be the new norm. Now, despite the, the difficulties that the beekeeping industry is facing, 
the honeybee at a global level and even in the United States is relatively secure. The honeybee is not going to go extinct. It is doing still very well across huge sections of the planet. But the same cannot be said of our wild native pollinators. And the two examples that are frequently talked about are first the bumblebees. And we have 50 some species of bumblebees in North America. As of today, fully a quarter of those bumblebees are probably at risk of extinction. Several of them are already likely now extinct, including uh, at least one West Coast native. Along with bumblebees, we are seeing declines in, in huge numbers of other insects. And another iconic example is that of monarch butterflies, which have declined by 90% since the 1990s. Now, there are two populations of monarch butterflies. There's an eastern population that primarily migrates from Mexico to the central United States, um, which occurs on the east side of the Rocky Mountains. And then there's the western population of monarchs, which primarily overwinters along the California coast and then migrates inland across the Great Basin and the inland Pacific Northwest every summer. That Western population has declined even further. And monarchs, because they overwinter at these known sites in clusters, in trees, they're actually very easy to count and, and fairly easy to keep tabs on their population. And we know that, that as of now, there are potentially less than 2,000 remaining monarch butterflies in the Western United States. And this may be the year where there are no longer enough butterflies to migrate into the Northwest. And that migration occurrence will, will become functionally extinct. Um, so there's some very dramatic questions um, unfolding right now around the, the long-term survival of the monarch butterfly in the Western United States. These trends are reflective of global trends in insect populations. A really interesting study came out of Germany uh, several years back where researchers had monitored the sheer volume of insect biomass in nature preserves over several decades. And what they found was that there was a very clear demonstrable trend of more than 70 percent of the, the insect biomass simply dropping out of that, those, those um, natural systems. Now, these trends are also reflective of larger um, global wildlife trends beyond insects. And the best tool we have for kind of quickly examining the, the status of, in, of wildlife on Earth is a a uh, project called the Living Planet Index, which is sponsored by the World Wildlife Federation and the London Zoological Society. And it's an, a big data effort where scientists aggregate population surveys from thousands of different species of animals, large mammals, uh, amphibians, freshwater fish, waterfowl, songbirds, and they aggregate all of those population surveys together and look at the long-term trends. And what we've seen is that over the past 60 years, or I'm sorry, over the past 40 years, Earth has lost around 60% of the sheer numbers of wild animals that used to roam its surface or swim in its waters. And there are, there are many contributing factors to the decline of wildlife and the decline of insects. These include the increased use of, of certain insecticides, and one of those insecticide groups that gets a lot of attention are the neonicotinoids. These are um, synthetic nicotine-like compounds that are systemic, meaning they're absorbed into plant tissue. They are sequestered in flower nectar sometimes or in pollen, and, and animals or bees visiting those flowers can get uh, toxic doses of these insecticides. These are also highly mobile in water. They are long lived in soil. And we've arrived at a point where I believe according to the latest 
um, monitoring efforts by the U.S. Geological Survey, there are detectable levels of these neonicotinoids in roughly half of all surface waters in the United States today. Along with insecticides, we continue to see very large scale uh, habitat loss. We see thousands of acres every day converted to urban urbanization and uh, urban development. We see uh, millions of acres of, of permanent perennial grassland in parts of the country being converted back to row crop production over the past uh, two decades. Uh, much of that for uh, biofuels such as ethanol, but also from livestock feed. So that's where we are generally right now with the status of these animals. And I want to spend a few moments here talking about the basic ecology of these animals to help set the stage for how you can take action in your own communities, in your own yards, on your own balcony with a flower pot to, to make a difference for pollinators. As I mentioned at the outset, bees are arguably the apex group of pollinators. So I'm going to focus a lot of my attention on bees in particular and native bees. There are uh, around 20,000 known bee species on the planet. There are roughly 3,500 to 4,000 bee, known bee species in North America and likely a number of other wild ones that we've not yet identified. In the Pacific Northwest, we have probably several hundred uh, wild bee species in Washington, <clears throat> Washington and Oregon, with much more diversity on the eastern side of the of the Pacific Northwest than on the west side. But these are animals that have uh, evolved to be very well adapted to our climates and closely adapted to native plant species. And for many native plant species, there are oftentimes specialist pollinators that preferentially uh, feed upon those, those pollen and nectar sources. Since it's really difficult to learn to identify all of the various bee species that one could possibly encounter, I wanna focus on three functional groups of native bees. And if you can just remember that there are these three functional groups, you can do a tremendous amount of great conservation work, even in really small spaces, uh, but also at a big community level scale. So these three functional groups are first and foremost are bumblebees. Bumblebees are social animals like honeybees, meaning that they live in a complex family unit with a queen who lays the eggs for the, the family. Her worker, her daughters are the workers of that um, family unit and they serve these multiple roles like tending the, the the offspring, they protect and defend the nest, they go out and forage for pollen and nectar resources. Um, they're also usually late in the life cycle of a bumblebee colony. There may be some males, which are the drones. And a bumblebee colony, unlike a honeybee colony, which we could think of as a perennial organism, one that can potentially live through the winter and potentially live over uh, many, many years. A bumblebee colony is a annual, um, an annual phenomenon, an annual super organism. It only lasts for a single season. And I'll give you a, a sense of what that life cycle looks like here in a moment. But these are animals that are very well adapted to our climate, to cool, rainy conditions, to cold winters in windswept uh, sagebrush country. These are animals that oftentimes nest in the ground in old rodent burrows. And this is the typical um, kind of brushy 
brushy vegetative matrix in which you might oftentimes find a bumblebee nest. So if you look at the, the uh, illustration here on the right hand side, this shows you what that annual life cycle of a bumblebee colony looks like. And right now, here we are in mid-January, all of the bumblebees around us are at this 12 o'clock position. So the only bumblebees that we have around us right now are the queen bumblebees, which have dug themselves down into the soil or the leaf litter, and they are hibernating, essentially just like bears hibernate underground. And these bumblebees are potentially all around us. They're pretty cryptic. They're hard to find. It's really difficult to know where they, where and how and why they choose specific areas to hibernate in. But in a few months, when the first queens start emerging on warm days, they're gonna leave, they're gonna dig themselves out of the soil. They're gonna look for a suitable uh, underground cavity or, or nesting space to build a nest in, might be a cavity around the size of a, a football. And they're going to construct a series of wax cells in that nest. I can go back here and, and show you an example of what these wax cells look like. It looks like sort of an abstract version of a, a honeybee comb. Uh, within these wax cells, the queen will lay a series of eggs. She might gather some nectar and store that in little pots. Um, so she has a food supply if it gets too cold to go outside. But she will sometimes sit on those eggs and incubate them much like a mother bird does. People think of bumblebees or insects as being cold-blooded animals, but in fact, bumblebees have the ability to warm themselves and to raise their body temperature much like mammals do, it, um, which is really interesting. So as those first eggs hatch, those will be the worker daughters of the, of the colony. They will again take over the duties of foraging for more food. They'll protect the nest and defend it. They'll, they'll be the nurse bees that care for the offspring. As the season goes on, if that bumblebee colony is successful at bringing back enough food, the, the later generations of daughters through a whole range of different kind of biological processes some of those may become larger and larger and more fully developed and have fully developed reproductive systems. And those will become the next generation's queens or the next year's queens. Also late in the season, the queen may start producing male eggs and these can typically choose to lay male or female eggs. And we could spend an entire day just talking about that. Um, but those new queens and the males are usually kind of pushed out of the nest. They will fly off into the landscape. They will find mates. After mating, those new queens then try to build up some fat reserves to, to survive the winter. They'll dig themselves down into the ground to hibernate. And the male bees, those drones die. The old workers from the old colony die. The old queen dies. Everybody dies at the end of this play, um, other than the new queen. It's kind of an epic life cycle that takes place. So bumblebees, although they're very obvious, they're, they actually comprise a fairly small sliver of bee diversity. The majority of our native wild bees are in fact ground nesting solitary individuals that do not live in a complex family unit. And these are societies of independent, single working mother bees that are out there excavating underground nests. These nests might extend several feet into the ground, into the soil. They may be lined with, with waxy glandular secretions to resist flooding. And these bees may sometimes nest near others of their own species, but oftentimes they're very, um, again, cryptic and hard to, hard to find these nests from above ground. Uh, 
They may simply look like places where earthworms have emerged um, overnight. But the life cycle of these bees is, is rather unique. Um, so again, these bees at the, uh, if you look at this life cycle here, the, the female bee at the 12 o'clock position is excavating this underground nest. And you can see a cell within one of these nests at the three o'clock position. She'll provision that with a mass of pollen and you can see that sticky yellow orange pollen. She'll lay an egg on that pollen at, a, at the six o'clock position. That egg will hatch at the seven o'clock position and the larva will feed upon that protein rich pollen food source and then undergo complete metamorphosis and then emerge the following year, usually the following year as a new adult bee. The male bees have no role in any of this other than emerging and finding females to mate with in the, in the springtime. And again, this is the way the majority of all bee species on earth live. Some of the common ground nesting bees that you might see in your garden or in parks or in your community include things like these green metallic sweat bees, or these longhorn bees on the right hand side. These are bees that are really common in the spring and the summertime in, in our region. We also have this last functional group in the Pacific Northwest of native bees, which are our wood nesting bees. And these are bees that nest in old beetle borer holes in trees or hollow plant stems. These include things like mason bees, leaf cutter bees, small carpenter bees. Uh, here you can see this leaf cutter bee, which gets its name from the fact that it, it uses its jaws to cut out these amazingly perfectly round sections of leaf. Um, they look oftentimes like the leaves have been attacked with a paper punch. And they take these leaf pieces back and they wrap their eggs and the pollen provision within those leaf sections and they use the leaf pieces to close off the entrances of their nests. The life cycle of these bees is very similar to that of solitary ground nesting bees, where in this cross section of this plant stem, you can see that the, the bee has crawled into that hollow space and um, the entrance is at the right hand side of this hollow plant stem cross section at the top here. And the mother bee provisions a cell with pollen. She'll lay an egg on that pollen mass. The egg will again hatch and feed on that protein rich food source, undergo complete metamorphosis. In the case of this bee species, they spin a silk cocoon around themselves and undergo metamorphosis within that and then emerge the following year with all the little bees um, exiting single file out of the nest entrance. And you might see on the bottom of the this slide that the cocoons closest to the entrance, these silk cocoons, the smaller ones on the right hand side are all the male bees. Um, so the, the female, the mother bee lays the male eggs last and closest to the nest entrance. Those are the first ones out of the nest. And those are the ones that are closer to the nest entrance so that um, it's likely that if a parasite or a woodpecker is able to penetrate that nest and start attacking some of the, the developing bees, it's the males that get attacked first. And the females, the, the really important uh, uh, bees in this whole reproductive cycle are a little bit more secure in the back of the nest. So, those are the three functional groups of native bees. I will just point out that we we do have other uh, flower visiting insects and pollinators in our region. I wanted to just mention butterflies. We unfortunately, <laughs> um, especially west of the Cascades, are a, a a landscape and a climate and an environment that is really not very rich in butterfly life especially compared to other parts of the world, like the, the desert Southwest and the, the Gulf Coast, places with amazing butterfly abundance and diversity. But we do have butterflies here. And some of the ones that 
you might find in an urban landscape are these. And I sort of ranked these. Um, I should point out, I'm, I'm somebody that knows very little about butterflies, but I use these three to gauge the quality of habitat in an urban landscape. On the left-hand side, you have the woodland skipper, which anybody with a little bit of green space in a city or a town, um, anybody with a little bit of green space who doesn't abuse that green space with a whole bunch of insecticides and non-native landscaping, everybody can have a woodland skipper in their, in their green space. The gray hair streak in the middle is a little, I, in my observations, it's a little more finicky. It likes a little bit more flowering habitat and a little bit even higher quality native habitat. It doesn't need to be pristine, but it's certainly not quite as common as the, the woodland skipper. The checkered skipper on the right, again, not a rare butterfly, but I would say that in my observations, this is one that's even one step a little bit more finicky than the gray hair streak. And so, you know, the more you can increase the availability of native wildflowers or flowering plants in even an urban green space, you can begin to kind of ratchet up your, your butterfly diversity. Um, next year, I'll just point out very quickly that although we live in an insect poor region, we do have some fairly rare insect, fairly rare pollinators and insects around us. The Pacific Northwest is home to the island marble, one of the most imperiled animals in North America, with probably only a few hundred individuals remaining out on San Juan Island. We've got other uncommon butterflies like the Martin Skipper or the Taylor's Checker Spot that you can find around us. We have species like the Western Bumblebee, which used to be probably one of the most common bumblebees in the Pacific Northwest, which is now fairly rare and fairly uncommon, at least in most lowland areas, most, most towns and cities, you're very unlikely to find this bumblebee. So we do have these, these fairly rare animals that are out there around us. Next here, I want to um, just talk through some of the benefits that pollinators and, and the habitat they depend upon provide to us. And I'll do that by focusing first here on wild, on wild bees in agriculture. And again, my work is largely based in agriculture. And we discovered through our partnerships with science, scientists many years ago that in places like the Central Valley of California in the middle of the Central Valley where there's no habitat present, those were landscapes that were ultimately really highly dependent on bringing in managed honeybees to pollinate the crops. But if you zoom out and start to look at the edges of the Central Valley, places with mountain foothills or hedgerows or shrubby riparian areas around them, suddenly you start to see farms that can get most of their pollination services from the wild bees that that habitat supports. Similarly, through our partnerships with science, scientists, we began to see that not only could pollinators, wild pollinators, fully um, support agriculture, they could also increase the yields of agriculture in some cases. In Michigan, our, our colleague Rufus Isaacs at Michigan State University and his team of students were able to, to discover that Blueberries that had native wildflowers planted around them had higher yields than blueberry crops that didn't. And although planting wildflowers costs money, the farmers were able to see a return on investment from those wildflower plantings in just a couple of years. Beyond just bees and pollinators, we began to see the, sim the similar trend with beneficial insects that prey upon pests. In uh, crops or in farms that have a, a significant land base of natural habitat around them, the, the predatory insects that, that prey upon these pests became much more obvious and 
it was easier to start making connections between that service and the, the economic value that they provide to agriculture. We also know that these wild insects are, are eating weed seeds and in some cases really high volumes of weed seeds in different crops, especially things like predatory beetles. We also began to look beyond just insects and see that the same habitat systems that are supporting these beneficial insects are also supporting things like songbirds and that the songbirds play this really valuable and underappreciated and under-recognized role in pest suppression in agriculture as well. Despite this, we are increasingly finding ourselves in a landscape with very little undisturbed habitat for plants and animals. And this is a, a photo, um, Liz, who gave the introduction today. Liz and I have, have both been uh, working a little bit on a collaboration in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco, a, a very um, challenging neighborhood with um, a lot of, a lot of uh, human uh, hardship and very, very little green space. And um, it's, a, it's a place that um, ironically, you know, the most iconic natural feature in it is this now butterfly mural rather than green spaces for butterflies to actually live in. And Liz and I have been honored to, to work a little bit with San Francisco Parks and to try to add a little bit more pollinator habitat into this, this tough neighborhood. But, um, if we think about the, the value that these animals provide to us and the connection, the close connection between habitat and the, the services and, that these animals, animals perform and the roles that they play in ecosystem function, it's probably also good to look back at systems, human systems of living that have fostered both human productivity and biodiversity. And there's a lot of these examples out there. One of those that I oftentimes mention is this land management system from Japan called Satoyama. And I went to college in Japan. I was fortunate to live in one of these amazing Satoyama communities. These are, um, systems that are highly managed by people, but have this incredible biodiversity in them. These are the interface of agricultural lands and forests where the forests are extensively managed for firewood harvesting and charcoal uh, wood harvesting and incense wood harvesting and mushroom cultivation in these forests and all of that constant activity and thinning in the forest, the very selective cutting has created a forest system that's a very porous, that has a lot of light infiltration ha and has amazing plant diversity in the understory and tremendous songbird and insect biodiversity in these, these managed forests. And these have evolved over thousands of years at a very low impact. And the animals have correspondingly adapted to this. In places where people are leaving the countryside and moving to the city and abandoning the management of these traditional forests, they're becoming darker, they're becoming less diverse and, and increasingly silent as they're less hospitable to many of the bird species that are really well adapted to these, these Satoyama forests. Similarly, the rice paddies have been uh, agricultural system that has evolved over thousands of years and there are now fish species that spawn in rice paddies. There are turtle species that do most of their feeding every year in rice paddies and perform this incredible service of eating slugs and snails that would otherwise be feeding on the rice. Um, so it's a system that su has supported both humans and wildlife for thousands of years. We have a very similar example here in the Pacific Northwest with camas production or camas cultivation uh, by, by native indigenous people. Camas, this 
beautiful blue wildflower with the edible bulb was once a principal food source for people. And Native people knew very, very closely how to manage lands for camas uh, for camas to grow really prolifically. There's this saying, which I believe is saying that comes from, from native people that the more you dig it, the better it does, which makes an amazing amount of sense because if you're digging this plant, you're, um, you're breaking the bulbs down into smaller pieces and increasing the propagules of this, this beautiful, nutritious wildflower with the edible bulb. And native people knew that they could burn the, these meadows to help create conditions for camas to thrive in. And yet, even though most of these meadows have been lost, and these were unfortunately the first spaces to be developed in the Pacific Northwest, uh, especially for agriculture, even though most of these have been lost, um, these are still the places that I go to if I want to find things like, you know, those Martin skippers or Taylor's checker spots or amazing birds like Western meadow larks. Um, so they supported both humans and they supported ag this, uh, this incredible biodiversity. We can see a similar example with hedgerows in Western Europe where Bronze Age farmers were digging in the soil to cultivate areas and they dig out rocks and throw these rocks in piles around their, their little plots of land and then the brambles would grow up into them. And these became these living fences and Bronze Age people learned they could use these to contain livestock within them. And these, this, practice of hedgerows and weaving those brambles together to, to create these living fences goes back so, so long ago that Caesar even documented his encounters with these hedgerows during the Gaelic Wars, where his um, armies were not able to penetrate through them. They, they, were, they were that um, formidable of a feature in the landscape. And over the years, the biomass has accumulated in these hedgerows in places like Normandy, and they become these big berms of land with thick vegetation. And there are these accounts even uh, in the Second World War after D-Day of, of soldiers trying to fight through these hedgerows. And ultimately, the, the allies learned that they could mount giant saws on the front of tanks to cut through these hedgerows. These hedgerows have gone through multiple world wars, they've gone through apocalyptic conditions, and yet these are still the lands that are the, the primary uh, sources of biodiversity in Western Europe today. These are still the places you go to find the rare songbirds and butterflies and interesting mammals. So, I've been really interested in how we can apply these ideas, these ancient space ideas to our conservation design today. And we've started to do that in agriculture. I'm gonna to touch on this briefly and then come full circle to our cities and towns. So the idea of reconnecting these, these, with these ancient spaces has led us to think about how we can incorporate native vegetation back into orchard systems uh, to bring back some of that biodiversity and the natural ecological function. It's led us to think about how we can bring back hedgerows and reincorporate hedgerows into our, uh, into our agricultural systems and rely on that Bronze Age technology We've looked at the value of these hedgerows in increasing the numbers of those beneficial insects, those parasites and uh, predators of crop pests. And through a whole bunch of complicated science have been able to tease out that these ancient space features are actually increasing the numbers of those beneficial insects again in our agricultural systems. And at the same time, decrease the number of pest insects. This graph here represents farms with hedgerows versus farms that don't. The, the white bars are the farms that don't have hedgerows on them. 
And consistently, we see fewer pest insects, things like aphids or weevils or stink bugs on these farms that don't have hedgerows around them in California. It's an amazing story. So we have also been intrigued by the, the resilience of these, these ancient spaces through things like wars and fires and calamities. This is um, our team at Xerces planting a hedgerow outside Chico, California, a se several years ago as the, the paradise fire rages in the background there. Um, and, and that's the actual smoke and heat from the fire way in the background miles away with an almond orchard on the left. And this hedgerow extends for many, many hundreds of feet along the edge of this orchard. And yet a day after planting, we're already out there looking at the newly planted transplants. And here you can see that leaf cutter bee that I mentioned earlier that cuts out those round circular pieces of leaves is already at work harvesting leaf tissue um, from these newly installed hedgerow plants. And here it is a year later with, with those transplants already beginning to grow and take shape. So this is where we're, we're headed in our work is thinking about creating these resilient landscapes. Here you can see another almond orchard with hedgerows, those tiny little green dots on either side of this irrigation ditch, uh, snaking around the, the irrigation ditch or the drainage ditch there in the middle. Um, and this is a conservation feature that we hope will create, a mi create migratory corridors for wildlife and butterflies and songbirds and be able to survive a huge range of, of climate changes and swings in temperature and, and precipitation and so on. In places where maybe woody plants aren't naturally part of the landscape. We've looked to create systems like prairie strips in agriculture to capture runoff, to provide wildlife corridors, to uh, reduce wind pressure on adjacent agriculture. Um, there's a couple examples of this. Here's a smaller example on a vegetable farm in the Midwest. Um, we're even thinking about how to incorporate native wildflowers as cover crops to increase soil health and water holding capacity and organic matter in agriculture. And we're looking even at amazing systems that other people are pioneering to do things like create native uh, wildflower meadows back in orchards and vineyards. Here's an example of that from uh, Lyle Washington, Klickitat Canyon Vineyard, which has done this, which has replanted a native wildflower meadow and grown their grape vines for wine production right in the middle of that. Uh, and then finally, this last example here that I, I showed earlier of this wildflower field border at this blueberry farm in Oregon to support the wild pollinators of that crop. We're also interested in nesting habitat. Again, you think about the bumblebees, which nest in those brush piles or the leaf cutter bees that are nesting in hollow plant stems and, or beetle bore holes. These are the types of features that they, they rely upon. So now I wanna um, kind of wrap up here and go full circle with how you incorporate these ideas back into cities and suburbs. <clears throat> so fundamentally, much of our own landscaping around us, which is largely non-native, can be transformed to features like this. It can be transformed back to native wildflowers or mixes of native and non-native wildflowers, like this beautiful yard in Clark County, Washington. <clears throat> or like this yard in Minneapolis, which is a mix of native wildflowers and fruit trees, or like this, which is an example from Portland, um, a mix of, of many showy non-native ornamental wildflowers, as well as some native ones, as well as vegetables there in the raised bed in the middle. We know from a, a lot of um, economic analysis that these types of wildflower-based, native wildflower-based landscape 
although they cost more in terms of <clears throat> um, initial installation sometimes, the long-term maintenance costs are typically much, much less. You can see here in the middle column, maintenance price, dollars per acre per year. A conventional lawn, an acre of conventional lawn, if you consider the fertilizer, the irrigation, the mowing, you're typically looking at more than $5,000 to maintain that acre of conventional lawn versus just hundreds of dollars for a seeded wildflower meadow. And is another a few more examples of how that contrast plays out. You've got the conventional lawn at the top there with extensive ongoing mowing, some fertilizer, some irrigation, some weeding versus this mowing, these last um, three rows here in the maintenance chart, there's a lot of mowing the first year and some weeding, but then that decreases year after year as, as the system stabilizes and those meadow plants become more mature. And those meadows are fostering these intricate food webs of songbirds and insects and wildlife, whereas lawns have much, much less of that. Um, you can incorporate these kinds of native wildflower plantings into things like parking strips and sidewalk strips um, right up next to roadsides. Here you've got the, the sea blush and the camas and the meadow foam growing on the edge of this yard. This is an example from Seattle with the, the blue globe gilia and the sea blush and the meadow foam. And here's another example of, of that same uh, sidewalk strip from a different angle. Really pretty low maintenance, uh, might become weedy, but that weediness is always counteracted by a much greater abundance of native wildflowers. This is a really beautiful example that uh, my wife and I spotted in North Portland one day walking around, <clears throat> looking at uh, the rosy checker mallow and the Oregon sunshine, and I see the tufted hair grass in there, beautiful collection of native Northwest wildflowers growing in this parking strip. You can even go further and think about how you diversify your lawn. Um, from a pure acreage standpoint, turf grass is the single largest irrigated land use or crop in the country, and they support very, very little biological diversity. But you can incorporate things, even some native things like set our native self-heal or baby blue eyes into yards and come up with these essentially what we call bee lawns or pollinator lawns that, that are much more interesting and I think um, incredibly beautiful and, and intriguing to look at. Uh, and I had to throw this in from a, a colleague of mine, you know, that the concept of a manicured lawn is one that goes back to the 18th century to, to European estates. And it's strange that this tradition has stuck with us. Uh, and, and I think we're finally seeing a sea change of people who are much more interested in bringing nature back into their own spaces and their own communities. And you can approach this kind of work at a community scale in parts of the country. There are community meadows around housing development or in land trust holdings. These are two examples from the mid-Atlantic states that create this community value and this community feature that, that are sort of the, the central nucleus of these living spaces for the people around them. There's an example that's close to home for me here in Port Townsend, Washington, where we have this beautiful native camas prairie that is um, intact and maintained by volunteers at a local park here. Native plants can be incorporated into bioswales and detention ponds. I really like this example on the left. This is showy milkweed, that broadleaf plant there in this bioswale that is filtering stormwater runoff in this really urban section of town uh, and supporting pollinators. And this is, of course, the host plant for monarch butterflies. 
Uh, we worked with Portland International Airport several years ago to take a very weedy pasture, a 50-acre pasture on an island in the Columbia River right in the flight path of one of their runways. And we spent three years, literally three years, converting that weedy pasture back to a native plant community. And one year it just had this incredible bloom of riverbank lupin, but there's also camas in here. There's, uh, there is blue-eyed grass. There are many native grass species in here. Uh, it's been a really, really intriguing and interesting process to watch unfold. You can incorporate native plants into corporate campuses, parks, urban brownfields. This is a site in central Seattle near the Space Needle, uh, restored with native farewell to spring here. Uh, another example in Seattle, uh, a site, and this was literally formerly a road that had been diverted and had created this this vacant space within the city and was replanted with native wildflowers for a really beautiful effect. And I've watched this site develop over a season now and within a single season in the middle of uh, essentially downtown Seattle, there are, all, there are already native wild bees that are beginning to recolonize this site. So thinking back about what we do with nests sites in agriculture, again, in urban set areas and yards, it's useful to recognize that things like stems and snags and stumps and logs have value to these ground nesting bees and where they can be safely preserved, they should be. Um, these bees also are, can be nesting in smaller hollow plant stems in your own yard. And Additionally, we're, we've launched this campaign called Leave the Leaves to remind people of the value of fall leaves as areas to support those hibernating bumblebees, to support pupating or hibernating uh, uh, insects of other species, to support moths that are trying to overwinter. Um, so where you can leave where you can in fact leave the leaves this is a really valuable practice and one that can increase the the volume and diversity of biodiversity at the ground level now i realize that any one of these things is kind of a drop in the bucket a parking strip planted with wildflowers is a drop in the bucket a corporate campus with a wildflower um planting is kind of a drop in the bucket, but you begin to put these things together, you begin to assemble these and suddenly you create a community level or neighborhood level scale that can have a pretty interesting impact on, on pollinators and wildlife in our urban core. Now, my last uh, remaining section here, and I'm going a few minutes long, I think if, if folks can, um, Stick with me, I think we'll wrap up here in just a few minutes. I wanted to just touch on a few habitat restoration concepts. So as you're thinking about creating habitat, you're usually confronted by um, this question of using transplants or using seed, uh, this plant material selection. They both have advantages. Transplants are great for woody plants. They are great for plants that you wanna get started faster. Um, they are not quite as finicky as working with seed, but they're also more expensive to buy. And conversely, seed is great for large scale plantings. It's lower cost, but oftentimes you have to do more preparation to create a clean space for planting seed. If you're working with transplants, um, you might be getting them from your local conservation district, native plant sale. You might be getting bare root plants, and those are very fragile plants because they don't have soil around their roots. It's useful to think about um, healing those in or burying those in soil, even if it's in just a, a flower bed or a flower pot until you can go plant them out in the ground where they're going to live permanently. Most transplants require immediate irrigation and then ongoing irrigation through at least the first year or two to develop their root systems and survive. 
And just like with a wildflower meadow, the more alternating species diversity you can use with woody transplants or shrubs, the more structural diversity will drive insect diversity. <clears throat> And you may need, depending on where you live, you may need to protect those transplants or those woody, woody plants from things like rabbits or, or deer that might be browsing on them. Seed is definitely more challenging. Uh, I'll cover a few fundamentals here. If you're working to use seed to create something like a wildflower meadow, we're, at Xerces, we are usually formulating seed mixes around a seeds per square foot target, usually a 40 to 60 seeds per square foot target. And the more species diversity you can have in a mix, the more you're likely to increase your chances of success. If you've got a 10 species mix, it could be that 10, it could be that five of the species in that mix are just not well adapted to the site. But if you've got a 20 species mix or a 30 species mix, the chances are greater that more of those species are gonna establish and thrive and do really well at a site. We oftentimes include bunch grasses in seed mixes to help crowd out native, to help crowd out invasive grasses, but also those grasses pro provide food for certain butterflies like the woodland skipper. The spaces underneath bunchy grasses can provide nesting sites or hibernating sites for bumblebees. And we usually include annual wildflowers in a mix so that you've got immediate blooming plants the first year, while the slower to establish perennials might take several uh, consecutive years before they're mature enough to start flowering. Um, wildflower seed is oftentimes really, really tiny, can be smaller than the grains of sand. So to spread it out over a large area, we teach people to mix their native seed up with things like sand or vermiculite to increase the volume many times over. So you've got this much greater volume of material to work with. And then you divide that into multiple batches, that mix of sand or vermiculite and seed and then you hand scatter it like chicken feed across a planting site to, to get an even distribution. Whether you're working with transplants or seed, site preparation is usually the first step in habitat restoration. You wanna get rid of the existing weedy vegetation. And to do that, and this is especially important if you're gonna seed an area, we oftentimes use things like black plastic or cardboard to smother an area and we'll leave that down for a full year to kill the ve vegetation underneath and create a clean planting bed. Um, sheet mulching is another approach where people will put down uh, layers of cardboard, of mulch, of soil um, or compost to smother an area and then you rake that off and plant over it um, herbicides are another tool that people can use, um, and that's controversial, and I will skip that for today. But keep in mind that the soil that you're planting in may have a huge amount of dormant weed seed buried in that soil. So you don't want to dig in it, you don't want to cultivate it, and the less disturbance that you can do to a soil to prepare it, the better. Um, we use a, a practice called solarization oftentimes where we will prep an area by cultivating it first, covering it with greenhouse plastic and burying the edges to create an airtight seal, and then using the heat of the sun to basically bake the vegetation, the weedy vegetation, and to kill off some of the dormant weed seed in the upper layer of soil. And then you pull that plastic off in the fall, you hand scatter your seed over it like chicken feed. And this is the result. One year later, the, the seed blush is starting to come up. Here we are, uh, again, the, this following year, midsummer, the farewell to spring is coming up. So this is a really effective way of, of establishing wildflowers. Now, finally, two management um, points here. If you're working with woody plants, you might anticipate 
um, some of the challenges, long-term management challenges being things like invasive weed encroachment, especially blackberries. So you'll want to be ready to weed around woody plants. If you're creating hedges, you might get gaps in them. So you might want to periodically evaluate those and think about how you're filling in those spaces. Some plants like Nootka Rose and Snowberry are prone to suckering. So you may need to mow or trim around those frequently. And some shrubs may become really large. They may become tree-like and then you're gonna to have to cut them and um, do some selective pruning to maintain them for size. So it's not, a, you shouldn't think about just planting these things and forgetting them. They require ongoing management. Similarly with wildflowers, you can get woody plants they creep into meadow type plantings. So you, mowing annually is a good way to suppress those, those plants. Um, wildflower plantings still get weeds in them. And so regular scouting and hand weeding can help manage that. Diversity can sometimes decline. So you may wanna periodically overseed or reseed them. And if these are sites that are just neglected due to trampling or uh, people not tending them, you know, you shouldn't be afraid to necessarily start over and, and re totally renovate a site if, if that's useful. And lastly here, I just wanna note that working in urban areas presents some real challenges around soils. Most urban soils are really altered. They can be compacted. They can have unusual drainage. The, my, the microbiology of these sites can be really altered. Oftentimes they're very alkaline from leaching uh, by concrete around them. And urban soils can be really contaminated with, with both industrial waste and things like benzene and petroleum that's leached into the soil, but also from human waste, uh, especially in, in big city environments. Um, you can try to amend the soil with compost, but oftentimes adding more nutrients isn't necessarily what our native plants need. These are, our native plants are oftentimes well adapted to, to nutrient poor soils and adding more compost can just sometimes accelerate weed growth. So again, we, rec we recommend that if you're working in urban soils that you minimize digging and disturbance and wear protective equipment if, if you think it's appropriate. All right, last section here, um, just plant selection for pollinators. Um, because we have such a diversity of pollinators and these are species that are active throughout the growing season, you'll want to plan accordingly and select things like willows or maples that might be blooming really early in the spring and uh, conversely late in the year things like goldenrod and aster can can round out the growing season with native uh, flowering plants as i mentioned we live in a, an insect poor region of the world and yet our camas meadows or the wildflower meadows that historically here were here provide a, a really um, interesting template for what we could recreate. Um, so looking back at the, the legacy of those ancient spaces, the knowledge that indigenous people had of maintaining these, these kinds of plant communities provides a really interesting and useful model that we could build upon today. Some of the the wildflowers that you could use for habitat planting include things like lupins are, and gumweed, uh, self-heal, camas, uh, goldenrod, sea blush, uh, tomcat clover is a beautiful little annual native clover that I think is vastly underused in, in wildflower plantings. Uh, you can download a plant guide to Pacific Northwest wildflowers on the Xerces website at xerces.org. Um, also, we've got no shortage of flowering hedgerow plants to work with, uh, things like Oregon grape, ocean spray, newt rose, snowberry. We, have, we are fortunate to have an amazing diversity of flowering native shrubs in the Pacific Northwest that are great habitat plants. And then my last thought here is that um, you may see 
pollinators, a lot of pollinators on things like Himalayan blackberry or knotweed, but recognize that the pollinators you're seeing on those plants are oftentimes non-native pollinators, things like honeybees, or they're pollinators that are already really common. And so if you want to foster the rarer, the less common pollinators, native plants are the, the way to really get that done. So to wrap up, uh, I know we covered a lot of ground here. Everything that I talked about can be found in a free publication by the uh, free publication by the Xerce Society, plant list, installation guides for wildflowers, uh, habitat and site preparation guidelines. All of these things can be found at xerces.org. And if you're interested in a community-wide effort, Xerces is also the home to Be City USA and Be Campus USA, a campaign that brings together whole towns to develop a, a plan of action and strategies around pollinator conservation. And you get this cool designation of Be City USA. If you're interested in this, you can find out more on our website. And then lastly, as I mentioned, we are a, a member supported organization. Webinars like this are only made possible due to the support of folks like you. If um, you have the ability, certainly check us out. We would love to have you as a member and, um, and put you on our mailing list and share our member publication with you, which has fascinating articles on insect conservation. Thank you very much. That's all I've got. Um, Liz, do you have a, a handful of questions that I should focus on here? Yeah, you know, we have a lot of questions. I just want to remind folks um, that you can always email us at pollinators at .org, And I've put that and some other links, um, helpful links in the chat box. So I hope you take a good look at those. Um, yeah, one question, Eric, we can get to is, do you have any resources and recommendations um, that show, or do you recommend inter including non-native plants that have flowers or structure types that support native pollinators? Um, do I have, I think I heard all that, Liz. You, were a you broke up on me a little bit. Um, non-native plants was that yeah, the what's question? Xerces, what's Xerces stance on including non-native plants in like a native pollinator meadow? Yeah. I, I think that they they certainly can have a role. It's harder to predict in like a meadow set meadow planting how non-native plants might perform or compete. I know just from some casual observations that things like Midwestern wildflowers tend to do really poorly with our dry summers here. They're not adapted to Mediterranean climates. But things like lavender and rosemary tend to do pretty well, although they have sort of the opposite problem of they can become really tall and bushy and crowd out native species. So I think native non-native plants, um, because of those, those issues of unpredictability, do a little bit better in more manicured settings like flower beds. That's great. Thanks, Eric. And one more question here. We got a lot of questions about lawns and how to make them friendlier for pollinators, as you um, discussed in your presentation. And there's some concern about disturbing ground nesting bees. And so do you have a recommendation of a good time to convert your lawn? And are there any ways to do that without aerating to prep for the seed bed? Yeah, so certain plants such as clover, and most of our clovers are non-native, those can be interseeded into lawns at any time. And that doesn't require any disturbance. You can seed directly into the lawn um, just by broadcasting over it. If you're going to do a wholesale re renovation of a lawn, it and you're concerned about ground nesting species or soil dwelling species, one way to do that is to just break the lawn up into zones and do a section or a quadrant in each year and sort of rotationally convert a, a lawn. But, you know, even, even if you have that impact on your own space, the 
chances are great that your your space is going to become recolonized really quickly by surrounding bee and butterfly and other other insect species from all around you. That's great. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, and thank you, everybody, for your excellent questions. I apologize um, that we don't have time to get to them all, but I do encourage everyone to email any questions you have to pollinators at xerces.org, um, and we can follow up with you know, resources and guides and answers specific to whatever land you may be working with. Um, thank you so much to everybody again for joining us. Thank you, Eric, as always, for an excellent presentation, and we hope you all have a great day.